Okay, we can begin. Tonight the topic is about atzvut, midat atzvut, sadness, which is the exact opposite of what we spoke about last week, midat asimcha, the midah of happiness and joy. In, in the way that happiness liberates one, frees him, allows him to be a master instead of a slave, Atzvu does the opposite. It imprisons him. And I spoke a little bit about this concept of master and slave in the past. Life is about either being a master or a slave. Not of a master in, at work, necessarily. Not necessarily that your wife is your master. Not that kind of a master and slave relationship. But a master of one's destiny is a master of the Yetzirara, where one has complete control, where he decides how he's going to behave, how he's going to act. A slave, meaning one who has fallen in the trap, in the hands of the Yetzirah, of the evil inclination, he no longer has complete control, even though he can retain control, but he has lost it. So whereas Simcha, in a sense, allows one to be free, allows him to behave more naturally, more of himself, atzvut, sadness, limits one. It imprisons him, and it's very, very sad that he's imprisoning himself in sadness because he's doing it to himself, putting himself in a cage, which, uh, of course, will limit him in many, many ways. Whereas Simcha was the proper use of one's mind, one's faculties, because as we explained, Simcha or joy is a state of mind. A decision has been made that I will be happy, I will be content regardless of the situation. It is a decision that we are, that we are cognizant of because we have personally made that decision. Whereas sadness is more a reaction not coming from the mind, but coming from one's feelings and emotions. So here one is operating using his mind with simcha, and here one is really not able to exercise his mind to use it properly, because his feelings or his state of mind, his sad state of mind, really comes from his feelings and emotions as opposed to making a decision to be sad. Similarly to Midah of Kas, of anger, what happens with Atzavut, with sadness, is that it detaches him from reality. It temporarily, at least, detaches him from his source. Kas is a lot more dangerous in some ways. Kas, anger, we compare it to Avodah Zarah, to worshipping idols, where a person has lost completely complete control of himself and was capable of causing tremendous harm as a result of his anger. But as we will see, sadness is not too far from anger. They're actually related. And the two have the ability to detach one from reality. And through this midah of being sad constantly, it could lead him to a lot of trouble. It can bring about tremendous harm to himself and to those who are around him. Some examples of what sadness can lead to. It could lead to bad thoughts, the wrong thoughts. It could lead to desperation. It could lead to something worse than sadness called dikaon or depression. It could lead to an individual having less energy, not motivated to do things. It could lead to feelings of guilt. And it, what's interesting about sadness is that you will see some individuals who actually lose their appetite and lose weight, and others who just the opposite, gain weight. Different reactions to a similar symptom. Many times people who are entrenched in this midah 
think a lot about death and about other things that are very negative and very depressing. They're, they can be very restless and they could also have eventually medical problems or symptoms that develop physically as a result of the continuous state of mind in sadness. Other than that, the experts tell us that anybody who is regularly sad, it definitely has an effect on his power of concentration and on his thinking, on how he thinks, how he makes decisions, how he goes about life, how he functions as a husband, as a father, as a friend, everything. Everything is affected by this one midah. Whereas other midot, you can somewhat hide it. They don't have as much influence or affect one's functionality as much. Sadness can affect one in many, many ways. But I want to make sure that everyone understands that sadness is not depression. Even though sadness can lead to depression, depression is something much more serious. And if anyone detects it in himself, Hazwa Shalom, God forbid, or in others that there is depression, then that particular symptom requires expert help. That one may be much more difficult to treat than just plain sadness. As the rabbis tell us, one who is in prison cannot free himself. He needs others to open up the door, to bring a key to get him out of this prison. Dikaon, depression, has made roots, has settled down in an individual. It's not just a passing sadness. It has taken hold completely, and it could be there for weeks after weeks after weeks, if not months. Chaz it v'shalom. It's already a sickness. It has made roots and settled, and it's there to stay. Chaz v'shalom, unless we do something about it. But that requires expert professional help depending on the situation, it may not be something that one can handle on his own. So we're not talking about depression here, even though much of what I will say, of course, can help somebody who's in a depressive state of mind. Sadness is bad enough, but the Kaon depression is, is a lot worse. So I can, I can tell you right now that if you detect, if you know anyone who has gone into this kind of a situation where he's completely depressed, he may not be able to help himself. He may require immediate professional help. Okay, so let's describe a little bit what this sadness is all about. How does it come about? And as I've done in the past, after we describe the symptoms and what it is, where it comes from, what we can do about it. Very simply stated, sadness is a change in the circumstances, not to the liking of the individual. Things were comfortable, things were just fine, and something has happened that is not to his liking. Obviously, otherwise, why do we become sad? Obviously, we, there's something that has just arrived that we don't approve of, that we're not comfortable with. So, why should we be sad about it? Because what is happening subconsciously is that many times a situation is so much not to our liking that it produces a, what we would call in Hebrew a matzav shel hasrat onim, a, a situation where we feel helpless. That's one. Another situation that can come about is a sense of loss. Somebody has lost a dear person to him or lost a lot of money. So there is a sense of either helplessness, frustration, a loss, disappointment. All of these kind of circumstances and situations have the ability to produce at least a momentary sadness. Where does it come from? Why does it come about that we feel sad about the situation? What's the root of it? Well, some people have it more than others. And when we spoke about astrology, I did talk a little bit more in depth about the various midot characteristics that each one of the mazalot has. 
And even though all of us consist of the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air, some have one element more than the others. And atzvut, the midah of atzvut, is much more found with those with a large dose of earth. Ha'adam yesodo me'afar, the rabbis tell us. Man's, man's build, man's essence, is really from earth. Even though we have all four elements, the essence of this human being, the human, the physical body, is earthy. And this earthiness, especially if you have a lot of it, brings about a certain characteristic in an individual which drives him to be strict, demanding, and even solitary. There's more. I just gave you three examples of what a large dose of earthiness brings about naturally in the physical human being that leads to a, a sense of, of being sad or unhappy with his present situation. Unhappy at himself. We're not even talking anymore about a sadness of having a loss, whether it's money or somebody passed away, or a feeling of disappointment with somebody letting him down, which can also be... Now we're talking about being sad at himself, which is not as bad because great, you know, you're not happy with yourself, then you're going to do something about it, right? There's different degrees. Some of them are worse than others. But here, this large or larger amount of earthiness brings about these kinds of feelings of being focused in, in a certain thing, wanting to be left alone, being demanding of oneself, being strict, conservative, serious, earthy characteristics. And you know what that does? These are not so bad in themselves. Being demanding, being a perfectionist, in other words, being strict. Yes, if you're too rigid, of course it's not good. But what that does, the problem with this, the byproduct or the consequences of these particular midot is that it basically blocks the ability of something called joy from entering his life. There is a lot of joy, a lot of reason to be happy, a lot of occasions to be happy. Simcha is so important in one's life. And there are things that stimulate and bring simcha. But here, there's a certain mental block. It's not really a mental block, but there's a kind of a block that this individual, because of these other qualities, he does not allow so easily, so easily, this joy to penetrate and stimulate him. And he always remains in a more serious mood. And serious mood, sadness, they're related. They're very close. This man, of course, can be helped easily. There were great Sadiqim who had this, let's call it problem. I don't want to say weakness, Hazrat Problem. That because of their seriousness, because they were so involved, immersed in Torah, because of their expectations and how much they demanded of themselves and how hard they worked, they were in a state of mind that was... I don't want to use sad for tzaddikim, but very serious and not as happy. And the children of these tzaddikim, of course, were unhappy to see their dad unhappy. So what did they do? They brought somebody who had a good sense of humor, who would be able to joke in a good, positive way, in a Torah way. And this is how they would be able to elevate their dad for a couple of days. Humor, a nice story. Ah, now this is somebody that they were willing to spend time with. This was somebody that they respected. This was not just a joker. This was not just a clown. This was a respectable rabbi in his own right who just knew how to penetrate that wall of seriousness. And many, many times it was with dihuta, with humor, with a nice cute story that brought a smile to anyone who was lacking a smile. Even though I just gave you a brief explanation of what sadness is and where it comes from, it really has a much deeper root that the Kabbalah explains. And it, 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 
I think it's worth it for us to delve a little bit into the Kabbalah. You will find this explanation fascinating. It's something that Baruch Hashem I was able to realize by analyzing various Mamare Chazal, various passages that the rabbis tell us, and put two and two together. And eventually I saw that even Rabbi Chaim Vital, great Kabbalist, mentions something of that like. That there is definitely a very, very strong connection between sadness, the state of mind called sadness, and the original Avon, or head of Etzadat. The sin of where Adam and Chava ate from the forbidden fruit. Kabbalah teaches that when they ate from the etzadat, from the forbidden fruit, bahem zuhama, the nachash, the serpent, put into them zuhama, a certain filth, a certain impurity, an impure state of mind, where the neshama right now is a little bit blurry. See, if the neshama would not be blurry at all, that neshama that we have within us, that soul, is a, is a kind of light. It's a transparent light. We would be able to see and know so many things and not be concerned about worldly matters. We're, we're human, but we're also like angels. We are connected to Hashem. We're connected to our source, or we're supposed to be, as long as we, we behave ourselves. And that neshama is, of course, full of joy. Rabbis remind us every morning, be happy for, for having been given an opportunity to be Jewish, to serve God. You know who you are. Right? People forget about that because of, of where they are and what they're doing, that they forget themselves. But if the neshama would be crystal clear with, and, the, and the neshama would not be soiled without any sin, everything would be so simple and so beautiful and make sense because we would be connected to our source, we would not be detached from it. We would just feel comfortable with what we're doing. What happens is when that soul becomes detached because of the filth, because of that contamination, all of a sudden his focus is blurred. All of a sudden things are not crystal clear. If all of you remember the first time the Hubble telescope was sent up, because they didn't do a perfect job on the mirror, the main mirror, it could not focus very well, and the pictures were not as perfect, were not as sharp. They had to send someone to fix it, to place a second mirror to sharpen the images. And sure enough, they became sharpened. Man's impression of the world, man's image of what he sees out there is blurred. Many times blurred because of all kinds of things around him. Some of them distract him. So therefore, he cannot concentrate. It's like imagine telling him, telling someone who's about to visit the White House, you have two minutes to see the whole White House. <laughs> what could you see in two minutes? There's so much to see. So many, the details you're for sure not going to see. You're barely going to notice that the various rooms have a different color. There's the red room and the green room and the blue room. With two minutes, you don't have a chance to appreciate and to see. right? Because we're so busy in our lives, working and doing all kinds of things, we, we don't appreciate what there is. And when, we, and when we do see things, we tend to see that which is no good, the negative, the hard, not the beautiful. And there's so much beauty and harmony in creation that I would expect all the scientists who have the tools to see the beauty to have become observant or religious, regardless of their religion, it makes no difference what religion, but to see God in creation. Look how beautiful, look at the harmony, look at the order. Just look at everything, how it, everything is so beautiful. No, they're busy trying to find out if there is life on Mars. Who cares if there is life on Mars? What about all those people who are hungry and now in Haiti or in Sudan? Isn't that more important? Shouldn't you spend your money and your resources there? So, the problem is people are not focused properly. They don't see things clearly. They see themselves. They see their own interests and their own agenda. And they can't concentrate on the ultimate purpose of life. What does he want of us? Why did he put us here to begin with? If people were to do that, they wouldn't be sad. 
Sadness is a fault. Sadness is a state of mind where we don't see clearly the reality. We are detached from it. And this has to do, again, going back to the very beginning of creation, where we are told by the Kabbalah, the rabbis, that the serpent, which is, of course, representative of the evil inclination, somehow seduced Adam and Chava to commit this transgression. And by doing so, he was able to instill in them this filth, or make them even blurrier. Their vision now has to become even more blurry, in that they now have to struggle and work a lot more to be able to see the reality. Now, what exactly happened when they ate from the forbidden fruit? They ate from a tree, right? Mi'etz hadat. And as I've explained in the past, this etz hadat, this tree of knowledge, what did it give them? It gave them knowledge. What's wrong with that? If anything, they should have gained from it. Now they have something they didn't have before. But what happened in the reality? They actually lost. They went down a level. They were much closer to God before. They had a better focus. Not as blurry now. In other words, how come they lost? Instead of gaining, they actually lost. So the rabbis in the Kabbalah explain the sense of loss that they have is that they now feel that they are missing something. Before eating from the Etz Hadad, they didn't have this feeling or sensation of lack. I'm lacking. I have everything I need. Now, all of a sudden, they discover they're naked. Whoever told you you're naked? They did not even know that. The Etz Hadad, as Kohele tells us, sometimes knowledge is dangerous. Sometimes there's certain things that you should not know. It's better not to know them at a given time. And even though eventually Hashem was going to tell that to them, He was going to reveal to them what they have to know. It, was, it needed to happen at a certain time and not before. Because it could be dangerous. Could you imagine what Genghis Khan would have done if he had a nuclear bomb? <laughs> He was a barbaric guy. What about the Egyptians and all these other civilizations? If they had all that knowledge and all the technology back then, Hashem says, oh, I'm not going to give it to them. Not to the Egyptians, not to the Persians, not the Greeks, not the Romans. I'm going to save all, all that incredible information technology for the end of days before Mashiach comes. For reasons that Hashem knows. It would have been too dangerous to introduce that into the world early <coughs> And that is what Kohelet says. Yosef Dat, Yosef Machov. That knowledge brought about pain and distress. Why should knowledge bring pain and distress? Because a person now has the sensation of, wait a minute, I don't have the latest gadget. I want to have, what is it called, that latest Google phone? I want to have the latest gadget, the latest phone the iPhone or whatever, all this nonsense. <laughs> and if you don't have that, you're upset, you're sad, you're disappointed. That it's a dot, that fruit produced a sense of lacking. I don't have, I need. That's what people think they need. And now look at the word in Hebrew for sadness. How do you say sadness in Hebrew? Etzev atzavut. The three letters of etzev, ein, sadik, bet, right? The first two letters are the same two letters as a tree. Isn't that interesting? Etzev, etz. I wonder if they're related. Yes, they are. The Kabbalah says they're related. That whole pain, that whole be'etzev til dibanim, that the woman was cursed, and now she will be in pain when she gives birth. Which, by the way, has to do with when she has the fruit. She ate from a forbidden fruit. Now, when she has the fruit... It's going to be painful, it won't be easy. And when the man tries to get his fruit, to cultivate the land, he's going to sweat to get that fruit. It's all fruit. But that's another idea. But it's all going to come about through etzev, through pain, through difficulty. All because of the etz. Just a connection, a Kabbalistic connection, that this all comes from the very, very beginning. 
by having done what they did, of course, by falling prey to the seduction of the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, they got themselves into trouble. All of this is a detachment. Had they been attached to only God and not introduced anybody else, they would not have messed it up. Even though we all know that this was going to happen anyway, the whole story is always intended to remind us of what life is like today. There is nothing that we can do to repair the mistake of the past. The blueprint has been set into place. This is the kind of life that we will have until Mashiach comes alive that will involve or require hard work to make ends meet. Women, until Mashiach comes, when they deliver a baby, unless of course they have an epidural, then they could be a little bit less painful, but still, it's not easy. It's a painful experience. And all of that has to do with the Nahash, with the Eitz Hadad. That is why Avodah Zarah, idol worshipping, is also called Atzabehim. Atzabehim, the exact same word, the exact same root. What does sadness have to do with idol worshipping? This Koach, this power out there that leads people to false gods, that misleads them, is the same power that misled Adam ve Chava, the same Nahash, the same Sitra Hara, the same impure forces out there that are misleading one to something which is completely false and wrong. At Sabehim, the same Eitz, the same Eitz, the same uh, uh, sadness to convince human beings that this, yes, this will bring them happiness, this will bring them good. But it's completely false. It's wrong. So therefore, this the sadness that comes unto the world, the rabbis tell us, is as a result of the Etz Haddad, whereas today we don't have the Etz Haddad like back then, but we still have the Klipot, the shells that are floating around, the impure shells that are floating around, causing people sadness for all sorts of reasons. So we have various reasons. We have the Adam Atzmo, the human being who is earthy in nature and naturally tends to or is inclined to be demanding of himself and to be frustrated and disappointed and unhappy when things don't work, right? Plus we have the shortage, the root of all of this, the negative root that exists from way back then that brought into the world a level of, of sadness, which is all a klipa, an impure shell of the sitra hara. By the way, the Kabbalah explains that this especially happens when people are about to do something good in mitzvah, when these impure shells attempt to introduce themselves into his life by uh, doing all kinds of things to remove that happiness or that motivation and drive that he may have had and to slow him down. And uh, eventually, of course, a person is, feels bad or is, or, is, or is angry or he's uh, upset at something. And it's all because of that shorish, that root that exists from, the, from way back then. Anyone, Chaz Shalom, God forbid, who remains in this state of mind, what he's really doing is giving more and more strength to that Yetzirah. As I said in the very beginning, it's a trap. It's a trap which will put you in a cage and slow you down, and which brings us back to the other Midah of procrastination. A lot of times people will procrastinate or push off things because they're just not in the mood of doing it. They may have other reasons. Remember, we spoke about procrastination being or coming for, for all sorts of reasons. Oh, we just found something more important to do. Many, many reasons why people push off things. But sometimes it's because we're just no longer in the mood to do it. And that's not good. If it's important, you should be in the mood to do it. And you should do it now. That's the correct attitude. That's the correct approach. If it's really important, you do it now. You're going to push it off for tomorrow. You're going to end up pushing it off for months and years, perhaps never get it done. And all of that is related to sadness too, because it's a state of mind that's trapping you and slowing you down and taking away all that zest and joy of life of wanting to do things and wanting to accomplish. It feels great when we accomplish things, but till we, till we actually do it, we have second thoughts. And that's not good. One who's not careful with the sadness, as I said earlier, 
there are many consequences to it. It could be harmful. And one of the, for men, it could be harmful is that he can, God forbid, become unclean but to matkeri. To matkeri or shedding one's seed in vain is sometimes brought about by an individual uh, you know, was willingly, he does it willingly, and that is terrible. And sometimes it comes about unwillingly. At night, as it's called a wet dream, in all kinds of situations where one has no control, but it happens. And that's all from the sitra hara, all from the impure forces who are bringing this about, because he's now theirs. He belongs to them. He's in a state of mind called sadness, which allows them to do all kinds of things. As I've explained perhaps in another shi'ur, the tum'ah, the impure forces, become strong by nourishing from holiness. That is why a Jew becomes unclean, becomes impure when he's dead, because his neshama, the holy neshama has left him, and what you have here is a corpse that had sparks of holiness that the Tumah wants to nourish from. So a Jew who is no longer with us, is no longer alive, has this Tumah all of a sudden that did not have before because though that power has invaded this empty shell that has sparks of holiness. They need that nourishment. They need to derive strength from Kedusha. And of course, they will go after an individual, if they can, that has some Kedusha. And by taking his Zerah, his seed, that is taking his strength and applying that strength to the Tuma, unfortunately. That's a, it's a terrible sin. And uh, it's something that one has to correct. Otherwise, he continues to be in that trap for many, many years. And this leads to other, more difficult problems in the future. What we've seen so far is that sadness is not a pathological problem. There are very few illnesses that are. For those of you who don't understand what I mean by that, sadness is not necessarily a physical ailment, something affecting your body, something that you have in you that is wrong. There are illnesses that are, that the body is physically ill, sick. Sadness has nothing to do with that. Sadness is an emotional problem. It's a problem of the nefesh not of the physical body. What difference does it make? Well, it makes a big difference. Guess what? Pills are not going to help you so much. And if you go to a doctor and you tell him I'm sad, oh, why don't you take a, uh, what, are they, what are they prescribed for, for depression? Huh? Prozac. Prozac. Why don't you take some Prozac? Oh, but it's only sadness. Take a half. <laughs> half a pill. It's not depression, so we take half, right? Come on, I mean, sadness, you're going to take Prozac? It may help you for a few minutes. Yeah, if you go to Afghanistan, they'll tell you just take heroin. <laughs> yeah, what, I mean, what do you think these people are doing? Why are they taking that stuff? Go to Yemen, they take something called gut. They chew on it. <coughs> something similar to the coca leaves in South America. Yeah, not chewing gum, it's a, it's a grass. Weed, they call it here in this country, weed, right? All kinds of stuff, marijuana, right? Crack, I think they call it. All kinds of, they come in various forms, shapes, and colors. And you have to pay for it too in money. And it kills you in the end. <laughs> but momentarily, it makes you high. You know, ah, it feels great. But you're deluding yourself. It doesn't really help your problem. It doesn't eliminate it. And the country, it makes things worse because you become addicted to it. So it's definitely, this is a bayan nafshit. This is a problem with the nefesh, the soul, the, 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 or the mind. Not a physical ailment. It's, it's the feelings, the emotions that are not operating well, that are in pain. It's not a physical problem that you have to kill the pain because one of the nerves, you know, is, is, is damaged. You know, sciatica or something like that, you know, I guess you need something to kill the pain. This is something at the, on the level of the nefesh, the mind, the, the soul, the, the, how one feels. And you, 
and uh, that cannot be dealt with medication. So what do we do? How are we going to deal with it? I saw a beautiful Chinese proverb. And this Chinese proverb says as follows. You cannot prevent the birds of sadness from passing over your head. But you can prevent them from making a nest on your hair. Does everybody understand that? You cannot prevent the birds of sadness. They come. As we said before, they're all over the world. They float. There's reason to be... Right? You cannot prevent them from coming. But you can stop them from making a nest on your hair, from settling down there and staying there. That you can stop. Very nice, very smart. Yes, very, very true. So you cannot prevent it completely, but you can stop it from making a nest. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to learn how to prevent it from making a nest. There was one rabbi who once made the following suggestion. Why be sad and why worry? If it's something that you can deal with and repair, fix, then just go ahead and do it. Do what it takes to fix the problem. If it's not fixable, then why worry about it? Why be sad over it? There's nothing you can do anyway. David HaMelech, David had a situation where he basically demonstrated this. He had a little baby boy from his new wife, Bathsheba. The first baby boy died. He was very, very sick. He prayed. He asked Hashem to save his life. It didn't help. The baby died. At first, the, his servants were concerned how are we going to break the bad news to him. So they started whispering. And he understood because they were whispering, he already understood what that meant. And he says, is it true that he died? Because they tried. Okay, let's get up. Let's go have lunch. And let's go on with life. What did he do? He basically is telling them, and he said it in those words too, I cannot bring him back. If anything, I'm going to meet him very soon. <laughs> After all, that's where we all go eventually. So what am I going to cry about now? Why continue with the sadness? There's nothing I can do to bring him back. Let's go on. Life goes on. He dealt with it immediately. Of course he was sad initially. He felt terrible. He did whatever he can. He prayed. He turned to God. Shem did not listen, did not hear his prayers for whatever reason, right? So he, he dealt with it in the best way he can. And what was that? Life goes on. There's nothing I can do anymore about it. So why be sad? Why continue to be sad about it? Therefore, any time one faces a problem, one has a difficult situation, instead of focusing on the problem, focus on finding a solution, if there is one. So that's the number one thing that we can really do whenever we are in a state of mind that you know, we're not happy, we're, we're a little sad and frustrated. Don't focus on the problem, focus on finding a solution. And most of the time that there is some solution. But if you focus only on the problem, it's going to make you sick. Now, sometimes we're frustrated or disappointed because we don't get our way. We're sad. Frustration, <coughs> disappointment is, is, is like sadness. What do we do then? Just remember there's two kinds of wills. Will meaning desire and interest. Sometimes we don't get our way because the reality is such that it's incompatible with our wishes. We can't always get what we want. Somehow the circumstances don't allow for it. It's impossible. It just, it, it can never work. So some people take it very bad. Well, yeah, you know, they wish it could have been, and now they, it didn't work out for them. They had invested a lot of money into this. They had their hopes very, very high on it. A better attitude or a better approach would be to display a different kind of desire and interest. There is the desire of having tremendous hope on something working out, and very much expecting it to work out. And then there's the one that says, well, I would prefer for it to be this way. All you got to do is add the words, I would prefer. 
And then it would make a world of a difference because guess what? If you would prefer, but it doesn't happen, then it's not the end of the world. Just adding the word, I prefer. Why? Because we're coming to the realization that we don't have full control over everything. We're more or less, as we say in Hebrew, in other words, we basically, uh, we're basically in tune with reality and realize that we just can't always win, can't ha always have it our way. So I would prefer that it should be this way. If it doesn't come out the way, fine. Imagine somebody working very hard on an interview. He hired somebody to write his resume for him. He paid a lot of money. He got himself a new suit, right? And then, of course, he doesn't get the job. He's very unhappy. He's maybe even f depressed. But if he goes with the attitude, well, I would like to get this job. I would prefer to get this one because it just makes a lot of sense. It's close to home. It pays well, it has good benefits. I would prefer, but if it doesn't work out, well, it wasn't meant to be. So here we have a desire, an interest in something that didn't come to be. Is he disappointed? Well, maybe, depending on how much he really had his hopes on it. If you don't raise your hopes too high and have certain expectations, it, life is easier. You're not gonna be so sad. Don't expect so much, don't demand so much because there's a lot of room for disappointment in life a lot of disappointment are awaiting those people who have tremendous high hopes people will let you down unfortunately and sometimes even your friends your own family husband shalom yeah people people have their own interests and sometimes those interests conflict and guess what they're going to think of themselves and not you first so yes life is not fair always it's not always fair who said it was going to be fair? Things do not always work out the way you plan them to. So if you go in with this approach, well, I would prefer and I would like it to be this way. Great. You would prefer, but it didn't work out. It's a lot easier to handle. There's a lot of people stirred up from the simplicity. What is that? There's a lot of people stirred, uh, you know, from really the basic, the basic simplicity of life. Just, uh, yeah, make it more complicated for themselves. Uh, yes. This, this sadness is somewhat related to anger, as we explained a couple weeks ago. And because of that, the Kabbalah has a suggestion. Since sadness is related to anger, one way to deal with it is by applying the Midah of Rahamim of compassion. Learn to be a more compassionate person, and others, of course. <coughs> Midah Rahamim, the Kabbalah explains, has the ability to sweeten sadness to sweeten anger being compassionate because what is anger anger is also someone who's very demanding very upset very angry at a situation that didn't turn out to be what he wanted he's frustrated they are related they're very close to each other one who's sad is somewhat somewhat angry at the situation he's not in a rage in a fit right but it's similar so that's another suggestion. Sweeten it with compassion. Train, train yourself to be more compassionate, more understanding person with others. And this, this, what, this one midah may help you not be as sad as, as often because you won't be as frustrated, you won't be as upset. It will help you deal with the situation a, little, a lot better. It will strengthen the ability to be happy, to be sameach, an individual who knows himself for having made many mistakes in the past, especially by having forbidden relationships, zera levatala, shedding his seed in vain, the Kabbalah is very, very clear about that, that sometimes what haunts him are those impure impurities or impure shells that have uh, surrounded him since then, ever since he, he committed these errors, these sins. He is being surrounded by all of these klipot, these shells, that will make his life even more difficult. They, they will bring sadness unto him. So here he wants to escape this jail. He has to begin to work on himself, to begin on working on repairing and repenting and doing teshuvah for all his past mistakes. Then he will not have this luggage or this baggage that he's carrying with him to make things more difficult for him. 
I even haven't touched about the other problems that can be in life as a result of certain sins. But one of them is that the sadness can be sometimes attributed to this old baggage that he has that he's never removed from himself. And they can actually be very depressing. Sometimes Mina Shamayim from heaven, they send him a sign. Get your act together. You still have a lot to fix that you haven't taken care of. Another idea that can be very helpful is when one is sad and he's about to lose hope is to remember that there is somebody up there who's taking care of him, who's watching over him, and there's no reason to lose hope. A Jew never loses hope because we have a very special relationship with our Father in Heaven. We know He takes care of our needs. He doesn't let people starve just like that. He doesn't let people to be on their own. He doesn't abandon them. A father does not abandon his child. That's the relationship we have, we have with him. We sometimes don't understand him. Why is he doing this to us? And yes, questions we have many. But we know that he's still our father. No matter how, how upset a father is at his son, he still loves him. He's still his child. No matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens in life, it's a true love. It's a love that can never be taken away. 99.9% .9 of fathers feel that way. Some are crazy. I mean, what can we do? They have a mental problem. They're sick. And you've heard of mothers who have abandoned their babies in a trash can. They're sick. Right? They have other problems too. But the true nature of God with his children, and with actually with any human beings, is that he has compassion for them. He created them. He cares about them. And therefore, no reason to despair. There, were, there have been individuals in our history who have made the mistake of losing hope, and it costed them a lot. One of them is a famous one called the Lisha ben Avuya. Lisha ben Avuya was a great tzaddik, Talmud Chacham, great person. He made mistakes, made some terrible mistakes. And because of his mistakes, he actually thought that he understood that Mishamayim, they're not going to leave him the door open to repent. That he's a lost case. A lost case? There's not such a thing as a lost case in Judaism. There are people who are far removed from Judaism, who are in the abyss, I guess we can call it, of sin, and completely removed from any, any Jew, Judaism. They're so impure and unclean. Even there's hope even for them. Every Jew is like a diamond. He may be dirty, but if you remove the filth and you can shine him up, polish him up, you'll see how, how beautiful, he, how much he will shine. Give him a chance. People don't know that on their own. They need somebody else to remind it to them. They really think they're a lost case. Oh, I'm too old to do teshuvah. I'm too old to change my ways. It's never too late. It's never too late. It's just a shame if you do it when you're very late, when you're very old, that you have a whole life that was wasted. But it's never late. Elisha ben Avuya is an individual who made the mistake of thinking that he has no chance. There's no such a thing as no chance. If an individual realizes that, he will not lose hope, he will not be sad, he will say, wait a minute, I better do something about it. As long as I'm healthy and I'm still breathing, I'm alive, I can do some repair work. Another excellent idea that really is really helpful in many situations is to talk to God. And I have some news to tell you. He understands Chinese. <laughs> yes. He understands any language you want. Swahili too. Persian for sure. <laughs> okay. Any language. Any language. Speak to him. You don't have to use your sidur. You don't have to use the prayer book. <laughs> Sometime tonight, sit down at 11 o'clock before you go to sleep and have a conversation with him. A friendly, man to, well, I don't want to say man to man. I mean, a friendly conversation between you and him as though he's around listening to you and he's listening. We have, we have a problem with that because we don't see him. We were just told, we read about it, that he listens. You have to believe in it. If you don't believe it, obviously, then... It's not going to work. But if you understand that this is the truth, and it is the truth, He created the world, He gave us ears and a mouth, then He can hear us too. He gave us eyes and He can see us too. He made us these eyes, then He has eyes, I mean, not physical eyes, but He for sure can see and hear, right? So what's the question here? 
He's just invisible. But we see his handiwork. We, we, see, we can tell he's around. Have a nice conversation. If, if you have a simple, natural prayer conversation with him in your own words and language, it does a lot of good. It is a very powerful method of calming one's fears, of beginning to do teshuvah, of bringing in change, positive change, and simcha into one's life. This is a very powerful method. And there's a pasuk. There's actually a pasuk that says, Karov Hashem Lenish Berelev, Dakei Ruach Yoshia, that Kadosh Baruch Hu is close to those who are depressed, those who are heartbroken. He's close to them. He's prepared to listen to them if they turn to him. Then there's an individual who is always wanting to be right, always wanting to do what is going to work out for him. And uh, he's always frustrated if he fails. He feels terrible if things are not done the way he wanted to. Not that he's a perfectionist, but let's call him someone who uh, always thinks that certain things should be done in a certain way, demanding. And things don't always work out. What should he do? What should be the best approach for him? Things do not work out exactly the way he wants. Rabbis tell us, In other words, give up your will for his will. You're not first. Allow God to be first in your life. Give up your will for his will. His will comes before my will. If you do that, he will allow other people to give up their will for your will. In other words, he will listen to you. What does that mean? If a person's attitude is, wait a minute, whose will is more important, mine or Shem? Of course, logically, it's his. He knows what's best for us. We don't always know what's best for us. We're unhappy that things are not done the way we want. Who is to say that this way would have been the best way? If it did not happen the way you wanted, guess what? That's the way he wanted it to happen. So therefore, what should you say when you're about to embark on a new job, a new project? Complicated, expensive, hopes are very high. What should you say? I, I uh, recommend highly. I'd like to this to work out according to Hashem's will, not according to mine's will. If this is what He wants, this is what should happen. In other words, whatever Hashem wants, that should be. If one goes into a situation with that kind of an attitude, let it be whatever Hashem wants. Whatever Hashem wants for me, I'm prepared to accept it. That's much better than having certain hopes and expectations and then things not working out. Whatever he wants. Maybe he doesn't want it the way I want it. So my will is secondary to his will. His will comes first. And if you, if you think like that throughout your life, it, it, it will save you from a lot of frustration and anguish and pain. Well, this is what he wanted. I did my best. Right? I really did my best. I followed everything according to the halakha, according to the rules. I did what I was told to do. This is the way he wants it. He's the boss. He's in charge. I'm sure it's for the best. Some other good advice <coughs> for those who really have a problem in sinking into sadness regularly. Listen to some music. We spoke about this in the past. Music is very helpful, very healthy. And especially if it's Jewish music, because then it's clean. You don't have to hear all this garbage in the background. I love you, I love you, I love you. Right? <laughs> you know, all these kinds of songs. Right? Shirek Kodesh. Holy songs. Good songs with good words. Read books of tzaddikim. What good is the books about the righteous people? See how they dealt with problems. See how courageous they were. See how they looked at life. How simple they were. How they didn't make a fuss over the issues that came up in their life. It's very inspiring. If you read a good book about a big tzaddik, it doesn't have to be a big tzaddik, even a, an average Jew 
who led, who led a good life, it could be very inspiring. Very, very inspiring. Very good idea too. You're sad, you're unhappy, maybe that will give you some inspiration. Another good idea that I saw is try to be mezakeh rabim. What does that mean? Try to help others find themselves, become stronger in their faith. One way to do it is bring them to, over to your home. In your home, have a chuk bait. Chuk bait is when you have a lot of people come together and the rabbi gives a, a talk or a lecture. By having or by hosting it in your house, the one who's having this problem of being sad and depressed, he will have a sense of accomplishment, plus he will be performing a mitzvah, he will make others happy, and in turn he will become happy himself too, that he's doing something positive, constructive. There is some good advice given by the experts, and I'm going to share with you a few of those. Common sense, common sense advice given by experts. This is not necessarily written in the Torah, but it's common sense. Exercise, regular exercise. Stimulate your physical body. A person who regularly falls into sadness can gain a lot by doing exercise. Take a shower. Yeah, you heard me right? Take a shower. Sometimes you're not feeling great. Get into that shower. You'll come out feeling a lot better after you took a shower. Eat a balanced diet. Yes, balanced diet is important in how you feel. Get enough sleep. That's important too. Don't have high expectations as we mentioned before. And help others build up their self-esteem. If, if you're a good social worker and you know how to deal with people who have problems like that, by helping others, you can be helping yourself. Take upon yourself small tasks, not large tasks and jobs that you can't ever finish. Something that's manageable, you'll feel better. I got something done. These are, these are just common sense advice by the experts that is definitely, is definitely helpful. Anybody who is in pain because he's going through major surgery, really has got to, how should he deal with the situation? Well, the rabbis tell us in the Gemara that all the pain and suffering that come about in one's life have a certain hour of when they're told to arrive and a certain hour when they're told to depart to get lost, to leave. Yeah. So therefore, one should realize that it's not by chance, it's all directed from above, there's a certain schedule, and hopefully the time will come for them to leave soon. We, person cannot lose hope. They're just saying, that's it, he's stuck with this. Turn to Hashem, pray to Him to get you out of this situation, and remember, in the same way that they arrived at a certain moment, they can leave at any moment. What about raising children? Raising children is not easy. As we said before, the mother goes through tremendous pain just through her pregnancy, through the childbirth. Later she has to raise them. It's not easy, especially if the children go on on their own and do things that are not always compatible with uh, what the family would want. Remember that this generation is, gen is a generation of Mashiach. The prophets, the rabbis have told us in advance that we're going to have a difficult time. And one of those difficult areas will be in raising children. So, one thing to be happy about is at least this is the end. Mashiach is coming soon. And we might as well just stick it out. But that is a simplistic way of looking at things. You can't tell that to just any parent. You know, those Mashiach is coming soon. In the meantime, they're <laughs> suffering. They're suffering. Any, anytime, anytime you're having a very big problem, with a child, raising children requires expert professional help. There are some people who know how to tackle the problems better than you. Don't try to do it on your own. There's nothing to be sad about. Others have had similar problems. You're not new to this. Ask them, speak to them about it. It is very important for one to work on Bitachon Bashem and Midata Simcha. Bitachon Bashem is Hashem, which means trust in God, which we spoke about and we'll speak about again in the near future is a very, very powerful midah that can help one in many areas of life. To trust in Hashem that everything is for the good, that everything has a purpose, and that He will never give us a challenge that we cannot handle. You're never going to get a challenge that you cannot deal with properly. You might need some encouragement, you might need some professional guidance, 
But nothing is not manageable, unmanageable. Everything is possible. So for that, of course, it requires one to be always besimcha and to have the proper bitachon in Hashem. One of the things that perhaps will help us the most is called emet. And midata emet, which is, the, which is truth, is something that we will speak about separately. Emet does not only mean being truthful. Emet also means to strive to always do things according to the emet. The rabbis tell us in the Kabbalah, all you need is a little bit of emet in your life, and that emet has the ability to drive away, to melt away all this tum'ah, all of these impure thoughts, all of these impure uh, states of mind, including sadness. All you need is a little bit of emet. How will that help us? Because emet is a big word. Emet means, I see reality. Part of reality is that this is a life that we are about to live very soon. Some live less, some live more, but you don't stay, nobody today has been living to the age of 250, right? Before you know it, you pack your bags and you leave. It's not, it's not something to therefore be, take too personal, to get too excited about. We've got to do our best job possible. We've got to take life seriously, of course, because we have great responsibilities, especially as Jews. But if things don't want to work out, we know the reality, we know the emet. The emet is, he's in charge, he's the boss. He determines so many things for us. We don't have full control. All of that is emet. And all of that emet can only be acquired when a Jew learns Torah. Because what the Torah will do for him, the Torah will, it will act as a GPS. It will give him the proper guidance. Hey, these are the true set of priorities that you should have. Stay away from this. This will only give you source, will only give you trouble. It will only ruin your life. People do not do that. People just think that they're here to, to enjoy themselves, to have a good time, and they, and they get into trouble. Before you know it, they leave and they wasted their life. 75, 76, 77 years went by, not having accomplished anything. What was missing in their life that would have helped them, that would have made a big difference in every aspect of their life? Emet, knowing the truth. What is the truth? Everybody thinks that they know the truth. But we have the Torah. And the Torah is very, very clear about what the truth is. So a little bit of truth can make all of this sadness vanish. There's another beautiful saying that I saw about sadness. Good humor is the health of the soul. Sadness, it's poison. Good humor is the health of the soul. Humor is good. You know, somebody who you know is sad, crack a joke clean one, right? And uh, it could be helpful, as we said before. Humor is, it can be very, very helpful. Sadness is a poison of the soul. It slows you down. It is said in the name of the Baal Shem Tov that if a, a Jew would know at all times that Hashem fills the entire universe, He's aware of everything, of all our thoughts and our actions, He actually controls everything if he chooses to, then why should we lose hope? Why should we despair? Why should we be sad? If we really were convinced of that, that he's aware and knows exactly everything, and he actually brings us to do certain things, certain things, then we would know. Now, again, we're not robots. We do have free will. It's very important to remember that. We always have free will. But as I will explain soon, only in one particular area, He's aware of everything. He's in charge of everything. Everything runs according to his wishes. You know how this will help us? Let me give you a quick example. There's a lot of people who are upset about what's going on in Israel today. All these Arabs. You know, let's take care of them. Let's do something about the problem. Whether you're a leftist or you're a rightist, you have different opinions, differing opinions as how to deal with this problem. Wait a minute. You don't think he wants to take care of this problem? By the way, don't you think that he's the one that caused this problem to begin with? Did you know that? So instead of trying to make peace with them, why don't you make peace with him? Why don't you, why don't you get along with him? If you got along with him, he, he wouldn't give you this problems to begin with. Oh, I didn't realize that. You mean it's his fault? No, it's not his fault. He's responsible for it. It's your fault, right? That you're bringing about on yourself this problem. 
So people are trying to find all kinds of ways to correct, to deal with all these kinds of difficult issues <coughs> through politics and diplomacy. It won't help. It won't work. Malek Kol Aretz Kevalu, the says something very, very powerful. Just remember, he, he is the one that's in charge. He's responsible for all of this. Turn to him. I'd like to finish with what I left out last week. Atzvut is the opposite of happiness. And therefore, a lot of those pieces of advice that I shared with you last week about happiness can help us also with sadness. Of course, they're very different. They're opposite each other. And we want to prevent it from, from happening to begin with. But if it has happened, you know, then we need to take whatever action we need to take to make sure that it disappears. One, one of those things that can really help us in life that will prevent or diminish the amount of sadness in our life is seder b'chayim, be organized. If you are an organized person and you have a healthy routine, you do certain things at this hour, every morning, every day, you're not wishy-washy. You're not floating around as an absent-minded professor. In other words, you know what you're about to do. Your, your day is structured. This is when I pray, this is when I learn, this is when I do my, my laundry, this is when I eat, this is when I go for a walk. This is when I read my emails. This is when I make my phone calls. Most people are not that organized, but you know how much this would help one? There would be no time for sadness because you're, you're continuously occupied. You're occupied in a very healthful way. You have a good routine. When a routine gets messed up, it throws people off. It causes all kinds of problems. So make yourself a routine, organize your life, and by the way, organize your room too. Right. It helps. It's, organize your life in every respect. Things should be nice and clean and organized. <coughs> it just it feels better. Imagine coming into your room. I know some people don't care how their room looks like. Their socks are thrown all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Their clothing. And you, you, you sometimes see it. Some people are like that. You know, the baby's they diapers are... That when they do that, roaches come. They leave dirty clothes on the floor. Yeah, that's right. That too. Yeah, they complain that they have roaches. They have roaches. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's no good. It's unhealthy. And Bezat Hashem will be speaking about this in another time about another midah, but it's really helpful to have seder, organization in your life. Number two, acquire yourself a friend. You sometimes need to speak to someone who you're very close to, you feel comfortable with. You want to have at least one good friend, one close friend that you can speak your heart about everything and anything. It's helpful. Because sometimes you just can't solve problems on your own. And, ba and guess what? Half of your problems will go away by sharing it with others, by telling them about it. And we'll talk a little bit more about this idea when we speak about the midah called the aga, worry. Number three, don't compare yourself to others. People are different. And the grass is not greener on the other side. No, it's not so. Be happy with what you have, with who you are. Don't compare yourself to others. Everybody has a different mission. Everybody's here for a different reason. Everybody's special in some way. If you don't compare yourself, you won't have reason to be jealous. You won't have reason to be sad and upset and all this. You're just who you are. And be happy with who you are. Be very happy with who you are. Because you have something that others don't have. And the next one is one of my favorite. Do yourself a big favor and don't listen to the news you read the news? Don't read the news, don't listen to the news. As much as possible, stay away from the news. You know why? Because it's only bad news. Only bad news. And those who live in Israel have a big problem. Because wherever they go, at the hour, this is the Hadashot from Yerushalayim. And what, do you think, what kind of news is going to be from Yerushalayim? Bad news, unfortunately. And if you're in the bus, they raise the volume so you could hear all the bad news. If you've ever been to Israel, you know what I mean. Wherever you go, two, 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 the hour it came, 10, 11, 12, the whole day, the same news, the same bad news. Another car accident, another tragedy, another war, another terrorist, earthquake. Do you, do you know that this causes tremendous stress for Israelis? They don't even realize what they're doing to themselves. This is stressful. And this, of course, is stressful for anyone, but especially there when they hear it every single... It's like, you don't want to hear it. You're in a bus. You just want to go home. You want to go away. You have to hear this news. Wherever you go, you hear the news. 
newspapers, internet, on mostly 99% is bad negative news. Who, who needs it? Try it out one day. For a whole week, don't listen to any news, you'll feel a lot better. And I know it happens to me, whenever I go away on vacation, no internet, no computer, nothing, no newspaper. Occasionally, if there's something important, I ask someone. It feels very different. Otherwise, you, what's going on? But you already saw it in the morning. Why see it again in the afternoon? Why see it again in the evening? Besides all the, the ugly advertisements that are, of course, not uh, modest, yes, which, which causes other problems, too, for the, for, for the eyes, you want to protect your neshama, protect yourself from seeing, from hearing all this terrible news as much as possible. How can, you, how can you go about doing your part to change the world if you're not informed about what the world's problems are? You can't, you can't change the world. I mean, in terms of yeah. there's politicians and there's people that do their part. I mean, well, obviously, people who are involved need to be aware about certain things. But there's, there's a limit. You don't have to overdo it. You know, there's some people who have to. There's some people who have to know what Rotor said, what CNN says, what the Fox News says, all the way Yahoo and uh, CBS. Why? You know, there's so much. There's so much garbage out there. Slander, Mashonara too. The goyim are not careful. On the contrary, for them it's a mitzvah to bring out as much filth as you can find about an individual. So for them it's a mitzvah. You can sell the newspaper for more. You know, to more people if you find filth. By us, it's, it's a prohibited to speak, to slander. So you see the difference of quality in life between a Jew and a non-Jew. I'd just like to finish with what I've said many, many times, that it is very imperative that a Jew continuously remember the famous passage of the rabbis, Kol bidei shamayim, chutz mirat shamayim. Everything is in the hands of heaven besides the fear of heaven. The one important area of our life where we have complete free will Complete free will is whether you're a righteous man or a corrupt man, a tzaddik or a sinner. Whether you put on tefillin in the morning or not, whether you eat kosher or not, you make that decision on your own through your free will. Where you, where you don't have free will, where it's completely in the hands of heaven, is how much money you will make, who you will marry, how many kids you will have, what kind of a neighbor you will have, whether people will sue you in court or not, are you gonna win the lawsuit or not, that is not up to you. And it makes no difference what kind of an attorney you hire. It all depends on your mazal. Mazal is one's destiny, one's package that he's born with. And he basically follows like a, one of those puppets that is, that is uh, controlled by strings. How do you call those? Marionettes. Marionettes? But there's another word for it. It's not changeable? Huh? It's not changeable? It is sometimes changeable because we are above the mazal. And we can sometimes change it, but sometimes, not always. Most of the time, the mazal that one is born into, that is his life, that is his destiny, that is his tikkun. That is what you have to live with. It's very difficult to change. We can sometimes, depending what the issues are. One who has no kids, chas v'shalom, according to his mazal, should pray. And maybe through some tremendous mitzvah or good deed, Hashem will change his mazal. So he should never give up hope. But if it doesn't happen, he should realize this is what was meant to be and it must be for the best. You can try, because we have that ability to change through Teshuvah, Tefillah, Tzedakah, repentance, prayer, and, and, uh, and uh, charity, right? But will it change or not depends on what he wants. Where we do have a tremendous say where we can make a big difference in the world is what kind of human beings we are. Are we going to be decent, good human beings? Are we going to get upset, be sad, be angry, jealous, or covet? This, this is all midot. Midot that we're learning about every Wednesday now is part of that yirat shamayim, fear of heaven. What kind of a human being are you going to be? What kind of a human being you're going to be? Your relationship with your parents, with your friends, with your kids, with your neighbors, with God, that's up to you. That is how you're rewarded or not. That is where you have free will. Everything else in the world, don't worry about it. There's very little you can do about it. It's all managed from above. Everything that was meant to be is going to be, this guy's going to be president of the United States no matter how you vote. This president is going to be president of Iran no matter what you think. Right? <laughs> the whole world is going to be whatever Hashem wants it to be like. Whether you're happy or not, there's a reason for it. He has a script. It's a movie. It's about to finish. 
we have a little bit of knowledge of what the script is like. So we shouldn't be surprised and we shouldn't therefore be worried about it. What should we be concerned about is what kind of a human being are we going to be? Are we going to leave this world with a good name and a good reputation or not? That depends on us. That is what we build and make for ourselves. That is something that you should be worried and concerned about. But even then, don't be too sad because if you made a mistake, just remember the famous sticker that I saw once in a car. In this world, God allows U-turns. <laughs> the police maybe won't allow you to make a U-turn, but, but God always allows people they to make U-turns. We, we don't have the power to give them tickets. Yeah. They have the right to yeah. pay Anyway, therefore, there's no reason to despair or to lose hope. <laughs> Hashem wants us to return to Him. Hashem wants us to do the right thing. And if, even if we made a, mis made a mistake, we can fix it. It's not another world, but don't be sad about it. Don't be, don't be depressed about it. Hashem is there to help those who are willing to help themselves. Thank you. All of Rabbi Kin's lectures are on my website. So if you want to listen to them, you go to the page called Rabbi Leo Kin. You can download them all for free. And if you want to, you can put the email to so Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, how are you? Yeah. 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 The influence a little bit, but, but it's, it's not so huge. The end, which is going to happen in the end. In the beginning, a little bit, but the end. What's next? Whatever he wants. So that's all you need to fix, basically. The most important thing. It's against his wishes. It's just the middle. It's landmark. He will not have this is called middle sanctuary. So now the sanctuary is not what he wants. Yeah. So he didn't let yeah. him. Yeah. He won't let him. Yeah. Yeah. So he has a change of yeah. uh, videos yeah. now? Yeah. Or not? If yeah. Hashem says, I'm going to let yeah. them do it. It's a smaller camera. They will do bad things too, but he's letting them. He lets them do what they want. The website is. That changed. It's not fixed. Right, oh, By the way, next week is uh, stubbornness. Oh. Ah. If you know anybody stubborn, <laughs> send them. <laughs> they won't come okay. if they're stubborn. <laughs> Bring the Virgos. I know some people that will come. Rabbi if they're stubborn, they're not going to come. Yeah, I go. Oh. Check class, how's the school? School, we're going to have a semester.